Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Paul Tetro, director of Ford's Theater. As the location where President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth, Ford's Theater celebrates Lincoln's legacy and explores the American experience through theater and education. Paul has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Paul, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Ford's Theater has a great role in our history, but prior to that role in our history, it, it was a great performance venue. Talk about how you unfold the history of Ford's Theater and how you utilize the institution as an educational venue. Well, I think what's great about it is that, you know, Ford's is one of the most visited sites in all of Washington. We have over 750,000 people a year come to visit that site. And they come to visit that historic site because they all know oh, that's where Abraham Lincoln was shot. So we sort of start with that premise, but we think we don't want them to finish with that. We want them to get so much more out of it. So then we begin to talk about the history of Ford's Theater, not only the history of the facility, but also what we sort of make the connection to Abraham Lincoln. As I like to say, in 1865, there were a lot of people getting shot and murdered and killed. We were in the middle of a war. But why was it so important, the individual who got killed in that theater on April 14th in 1865, why did that matter? And why did it change the entire course of the trajectory of our country after that? And That's what's interesting. And, and the point <clears throat> that, that the assassination happened was it's such an interesting point. Had it happened earlier, the country would have been different. Had it happened later, the country would have been different. What ended up happening at that instance is you had the great tragedy um, of, of that century uh, take place on the cusp of a great change and at the culmination of another great tragedy, the Civil War. Right. And, and, and all of a sudden, things shifted. There was a dislocation amongst his supporters and his detractors, and there was a, there was a tremendous change in the country that came uh, both the, uh, as a result of what came, bef came before and, and uh, as a result of the event itself. Absolutely. I mean, there's an extraordinary book by one of our advisory council members, Jay Winnick, called April 1865, The Month That Changed America. And it really is, if you think about it, in April 1865, we had the surrender of Appomattox. Right. We had the, the rush to, uh, you know, the, the turn of taking over of Richmond, the, the Confederate headquarters, with the surrender at Appomattox. Then you have the assassination. You have the, you know, the hunt for John Wilkes Booth. And then the, the whole, what was going to happen with the country was, was taken in a sort of different direction. But had it happened, as you said, you know, six months earlier, I think the entire, we would pro we'd probably have two separate countries here. Instead of having one country the way it did and the way Lincoln had you know, wanted it for all that time. And six months <clears throat> later, the, the end of the war and how the now United States, the newly united United States, uh, treated the southern states might have been significantly different. Absolutely. I mean, I think what's interesting is, you know, had Lincoln lived, I think Reconstruction would have been completely different yes. than what happened. Um, and, and who knows what would have happened with slavery, who knows what would have happened with emancipation and all of those things had Lincoln lived. But when, with Lincoln not living, I think the reality is it could have actually been much worse. But I think that Lincoln cast such a long shadow, even in death, that I think that the Andrew Johnson, the president, and other cabinet members really had Lincoln's sort of, um, his, his thinking and his theory of reconstruction and his theory of allowing the South to rise back up, allowing the South to rejoin us as a state and not punish them. I think they were, that was ringing in their ears. So I think, you know, though it wasn't the way it could have gone had Lincoln lived. I think the fact that Lincoln was such a strong present, casting such a long shadow even in death, I think um, the country went in a better direction than, than it could have gone. So you have this historic <clears throat> site. Talk about how you administer the site and the visitor experience. They come, as you say, as because the Ford's Theater is an attraction. Do they leave just thinking that Ford's Theater is an attraction, one of the places to hack off on their visit? Well, I, I hope not. I think what we've done over the last 10 or so years is, you know, and the theater is uh, reopened in 1968, so we're coming close to celebrating our 50th anniversary of reopening. 
And I think what we've done is, over the last uh, 10 years or so, we've really changed the way that the theater operates. The theater is owned by the National Park Service, right. so we work in a public-private partnership with the National Park Service, Ford's Theater Society, of which I'm the director of and I'm the head of that organization, work in partnership. And over the last 10 years, I think we've worked very hard to change the visitor experience so that it's more than just check the box, we've been to Abraham Lincoln's death site, we've seen the place where he got shot, to more of an education. We think and we truly believe that we create the only place in Washington, D.C. where you can get sort of an extensive uh, understanding of Abraham Lincoln's presidency and Abraham, the qualities of Abraham Lincoln's leadership, which is what our mission is really all about. How do you connect the place with the presidency of, uh, of uh, this man, and how do you uh, connect the space with the point in time that was that inflection point? We have a tagline that we use at Ford's uh, called, Where Lincoln's Legacy Lives. Right. Because we want people to really understand that this is not only the site, the location, the historical site where Lincoln got, was shot and Lincoln gasped his last breaths in on this earth. Well, it's where Lincoln's legacy literally started. Began, exactly. And so we take that and then we try to use those, you know, we've created an expansive education program where we use oratory, uh, we work with Lincoln's speeches and we work with great orators throughout the, the generations, uh, teaching young people about the power of speech, teaching young people about the power of sort of le Lincoln's lessons in leadership. And those are some of the things that we take to sort of really expand that. So that the assassination, we understand it, it might be the, the way in which people enter the site or, or plan to visit the site, but when they leave, we hope that they leave with so much more. So do you have educators or reenactors or? We have, we, uh, what we have on our staff is we have a full education department. We have an education director and we have an education team. We have teaching artists. So we not only bring students to the site, mm -hmm. but we also go out to schools and we expand it. We have an extensive teacher um, uh, fellowship program. We have a teacher training program. We bring teachers from all over the country and the sort of metro area here, bring teachers to the site and give them an expanded um, experience. With regards to reenactors, what we've done is of course, the Park Service provides um, park rangers to right. sort of interpret and tell the story. What we've done is utilizing our expertise in sort of theatrical presentation. We've taken, we've, at, we've gotten several playwrights, we've commissioned them to write short plays about either the assassination or we've gotten them to write plays about the Appomattox or we've gotten them to write plays about the Lincoln-Douglas experience and Lincoln-Douglas relationship, both Stephen Douglas and Frederick Douglas, and we present those plays. So then we hire real actors, we hire professional actors, and we do those plays theatrically. And so what we do is we try to make history come alive because many people, you know, people will learn in different ways. Some people can read from a book and get the, the facts. Some people want to hear a lecture and get the facts. Some people need something a little more alive. And so that's where we come in with sort of taking the, our theater expertise and really making the site come alive. Do you connect to other organizations that are uh, exposing <clears throat> different aspects of the Civil War era? How, how does that Absolutely. work? Absolutely. We partner with a number of groups in Washington. The Frederick Douglass Historical Site, uh, Lincoln's Cottage, uh, Tudor Place in Georgetown, the White House Historical Association. We partner with all of those organizations because we recognize that we can tell one piece of the story. Right. But sort of Civil War Washington and that era and that time is so critical to sort of us as a country and us as a development of a people and who we are that we want to connect with all those groups. So when we bring in these teacher fellows, we bring them in in the summer when they're out of their classes for a week-long period. And each day they will go to a different site. They'll go to the Frederick Douglass site for a day. They'll go to Lincoln Cottage for a day. They'll go to the two place for a day and then they'll spend a day at Ford's Theater and we coordinate with all of those people and we give an experience for those teachers that are coming from all across the country something that I thought was um, a, 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 something that teachers get all the time but I realize in talking to these teachers after they spent a week at in all of these sites in here in Washington that this is so unique to them that they come back again and again because the experience is so you know, you know and amazing. It's, it's connected learning 
right? right? It's connected in terms of partnerships with each of the partners focusing on, on what they do very well. It's connected in that it's connected to the historical site and, and the sensibility that that site imparts, uh, right. the physical presence in that, uh, in that site. In terms of how your staff works, do you have a large staff? We have about, uh, you know, a sort of ever-expanding staff. Um, it's, when I got here, it was, there were sort of 20 people on staff, and now we have about 45 full-time people. And then we have, during the height of our season, we'll take on additional uh, seasonal people, and then that does not include any of the artists or directors or designers that we work with. Plus the National Park Service Plus the people. National Park so Service, you, and additional people. And then you have, you have docents and, and have other a, a volunteers. tremendous volunteer corps that come in and work with us both in the interpretation throughout the day, but also work with us on theatrical programming, work with us on ushering our programs. So it's a fairly robust uh, staff that we have at the theater. And uh, how, how does your revenue model work? Is it, is it mostly earned or contributed income? Or? It's actually about um, probably a little more, um, it's, it's in a 50-50 model. Mm -hmm. We raise about $8 million a year. Um, from uh, private individuals, corporations, foundations, some government money, but a very small part of that. Um, we do a lot on ticket sales. Uh, we have a full theatrical programming uh, season of place that we do every year. So that brings in about $4 million a year. And then we have uh, entrance fees for people that come to daytime visits. We have a gift shop. We have concessions, you know, all of the sort of usual things that you would have there. But uh, it's about, next year I think our budget is about $14 million. So it's about $8 million in uh, earned revenue and about uh, 7 or so, $6 million in uh, earned revenue. And I understand that you've had about six million daytime visitors in the t in the ten years that you've led the organization. Yes, we've had a lot of lot of people come through there. I'm always amazed, especially in the spring, when we we can get you know sort of three thousand people a day coming through the site. Sometimes you know thirty thirty five thousand people in a week coming through the site. It's really amazing, and it's uh, it's it's fairly intensive in the summer, in the spring, in the summer. How do you prepare for this role as a, as as a career move? You didn't start off. Uh... I, I certainly didn't. I mean, <laughs> I originally came to Washington. I came to Ford's Theater to enhance the theatrical experiences uh, at the theater. My background is all in uh, had been in, in theater, primarily in producing theater and managing theater. And so I came here with that in mind, and of course, you know, you get it. no job is exactly the way it's advertised mm -hmm. or exactly as you envision. Uh, and when you get there, you sort of grow into it. Uh, I tell people that I came here as a theatrical manager, and over the last 10 years, I've become one of the foremost scholars on Abraham Lincoln. So um, I didn't plan on that, but that's the way it happens. And you previously also worked at Madison Square Garden. I did. I had a, a two and a half year stint at Madison Square Garden as my, I like to say, my foray into the commercial uh, arts industry. When you look at Ford's Theater, which is a, a, a nonprofit but public institution, you look at Madison Square Garden, which is uh, more on the commercial side. Right. Um, how do you, uh, you compare this, the complexity of the management challenge between a, an organization that is uh, commercial? And, and large and a huge performance venue and so on, uh, and Ford's Theater. I, I think it's just different, different complexities. I mean, the very clear thing is that, you know, in a for-profit enterprise like Madison Square Garden, every decision is made about the bottom line. Every decision is made based on money. And, you know, my, with that uh, short stint in my um, resume, everything else I have done has been in the nonprofit sector. And the difference with the nonprofit sector is you don't make decisions exclusively based on money. And it's just, it's, it's not only refreshing, it's actually a, a model that for-profit entities are to take on. Because what you do is you get to make decisions based on mission, you make decisions based on people, you make decisions on a much more longer term uh, basis. You're not worried about this quarterly profit or what's the quarter going to say to the shareholders or, or the Wall Street or anything like that. You're making decisions on a much broader basis. And for me, I mean, after that sort of two and a half year stint at Madison Square Garden, I vowed I'd probably never return to work in the commercial sector because 
that uh, experience of every decision is based on the bottom line, it's, it's, it's very cold, first of all. And it's also, I think it's ultimately short-sighted. I think it's ultimately short-sighted. So the decisions that we make at Ford's, we try and make them, you know, last year we had a surplus. This year we're having a small deficit. And, you know, I literally said to the board last m monthly meeting that we had a board meeting, I said, you know, if you want, we could lay off staff and we could get the numbers balanced. But I said next year we're going to have to ramp them up because we have a very special year coming up, and that would be short-sighted. And the board said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. I mean, I sort of set it for dramatic effect because I knew we wouldn't do that. But the reality is you can't, um, you can't uh, not pay attention to the finances of the bottom line. But that's not the exclusive and only way you make decisions. The commercial consciousness, the consciousness of, of ensuring that your earned income and your contributed income are sufficient and they balance, the consciousness to ensure that you have diversified revenue streams, the consciousness that you want to get as much bang for the buck for the invested dollars so that you are lean and you, and you operate with efficiency, all that consciousness is still there. Right. It's just the purpose to, uh, that those, to which those disciplines are applied is, is different. Absolutely, absolutely. All of those are there. I mean, if, if, you have, if you pay no attention to those, frankly, you just won't be very you'll successful. You'll be out of business. And you'll be out of business and you won't be, ever, you won't be hired. So all of those are important, but they're, you're not making it, – it's, it's what's interesting is you make – it's sort of this word that my, I think my staff is tired of hearing is balance. You know, you make decisions based on balance thinking. It's not just about what's the bottom line going to be. It's about what's the bottom line going to be. What's the staffing situation going to be? What's next year look like? What's two years look like from now? What do we did we have a, a de deficit for these reasons? You know, it's looking at the whole picture and really looking at what the balance of the situation is, rather than just saying, "Well, the next quarter is going to be tough. Let's cut those expenses." You just can't operate that way. You referred to next year being a special year. Is it is it top secret, or can you share some of those plans no, no, with no. us? No, no, no. I mean, it's it's quite the quite not top secret. And next year is the 150th anniversary of the uh, assassination of Abraham Lincoln. It's really, you know, we've been celebrating or or sort of commemorating for four years. Not me, but the country. Uh, the Civil War, the 150th right. anniversary of the Civil War. And there's been each of the battles, you know, Gettysburg and what have you, and the, the uh, Gettysburg Address, they've had these sort of uh, anniversaries that have come up. Well, we, having to our special place in history, are at the end of that celebration. But I think next spring, you know, going back to where we started with the sort of uh, uniqueness of April 1865, you have on March 4th, you have the second inaugural, the 150th anniversary right. of the second inaugural. Some people argue the greatest inaugural speech ever made in the history of our country. Uh, April 9th, you have the surrender at Appomattox. The 14th, you have the assassination of Lincoln. Uh, and so, you know, next spring for us is going to be a very important time. We've got a number of some commemorations. We've got a number of remembrances. As we've been very cautious uh, and conscientious to, to be aware of at Ford's, it's not a celebration. We are having a commemoration. We're remembering Lincoln. And as you said earlier, I mean, 150 years ago, April 14th, 1865, that is the beginning of Lincoln's legacy. So we are celebrating 150 years of the beginning of that legacy. And so we have tremendous amount of programming scheduled for that next year. We're going to do a 36-hour opening at the site on April 14th to April 16th where people could come and visit the site at 2 in the morning on April 14th. Which is interesting because from 10.30 in the evening on April 14th until 7.22 the next morning, that's when Abraham Lincoln was lying uh, fighting for his life right. in the Peterson House, and there was a vigil that was created outside 10th Street at that time. So we are going to recreate that vigil outside 10th Street on April uh, in uh, April of next year. And so that's one of the things we're also planning a special exhibit where we're bringing artifacts that have been scattered all over the country since April 1865 back to Ford's Theater. Artifacts that were on the president, artifacts that were on Mary Lincoln, all artifacts that were in the theater at that time were bringing back to Ford's Theater for a very special exhibit. So there's a number of uh, sort of special things that we've got planned for next year. It's going to be a, a really 
uh, important year for Ford's Theater. And the dates again? April 14th and April 15th, but you know, we'll be beginning sort of March 4th with the second inaugural. We're going to do a number of panels and symposiums, bringing some of our, our scholars and our advisory council people in. The first play in January, February is going to be a play that we've commissioned just in honor of this called The Widow Lincoln. And it is a play that takes place right after the Lincoln assassination where Mary Lincoln, most people don't know this story, but Mary Lincoln held herself up in the White House for about a month after the assassination. And this playwright imagines and envisions what that was like, who came to visit her, mm. real and imagined. It's going to be a fascinating program. We'll have to make sure that we're in Washington uh, so. around that time. Paul Tetro, thank you so much for sharing the, the, the thinking and the work of Ford's Theater. Thank you so much for sharing your work on exposing the life and legacy of Abraham Lincoln. And thank you for your insights. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks.